Hi, my name is Jack Chapman. I'm a forester with the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the lands program, uh, wildlife management areas, our approach to managing the wildlife management areas, and then finally uh, the prescription I wrote for Fry Mountain Compartment F, which is what we're going to see uh, pre, during, and post harvest uh, through the tour series that uh, the main woodland owners are putting on. So very briefly, our mission and overview, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife protects and manages Maine's fish and wildlife for their habitats, promotes Maine's outdoor heritage, and safely connects people with nature through responsible recreation, sport, and science. It was established in 1880 to protect big game populations. Since then, it's evolved to include protection and management of fish, non-game wildlife, habitats, and the restoration of endangered species. In addition to its conservation duties, IFNW also is responsible for enabling and promoting the safe enjoyment of Maine's outdoors. So within IFNW, there is the lands program, which I'm a part of, and we're tasked with managing the wildlife management areas, known as the WMAs for short, in, con in conjunction with the regional wildlife biologists. And we have three major objectives to create, maintain, and improve wildlife habitat, create, maintain, and improve public access infrastructure, and to demonstrate the benefits of active management for wildlife to educate private and public landowners. The staff of the lands program consists of the land management biologist, Eric Hoare, the deer habitat biologist, Daniel Hill, the forester, myself, and two natural resource managers, Jared Gregory and Matt Rourke. So the department owned lands are known as the wildlife management areas and they provide statewide ecologically based system of land holdings to protect and enhance important wildlife habitats and to provide opportunities for all types of public recreation. As such, they are located close to organized towns and the, co and the coast to provide ease of access for a majority of the state's population. Currently, we have 69 areas. Uh, in total, that's about 110,000 acres of land uh, roughly 60% is operable upland, and the remaining 40% is inoperable, which means that it's very wet. So this includes wading bird and waterfowl habitat, priority wetlands, and also the open water resources associated with them. They range in size uh, rather drastically. We have some that are less than 100 acres, and everything up to 11,000 11, acres in size. There are management areas in every county within the state. We also have management authority on over 200 coastal seabird islands, 40 of which are owned by IFNW. Areas within the wildlife management areas have been identified and prioritized by regional and statewide biologists for the ecological and wildlife habitat values. And this helps us with how the resources on the properties should be managed. So land acquisition. We acquire land of ecological significance to provide habitat for wildlife species, but also to provide public access opportunities. And we have several avenues to acquire land. There's the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act uh, that was established by uh, Pittman and Robertson, so it's often called the Pittman and Robertson Act, or PR for short, and, and that places uh, an excise tax on firearms, ammunition, and archery equipment uh, to be used by the states to fund wildlife restoration. The revenue from that tax goes to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and then distributed amongst the states. Uh, since 1939, the account has generated over $10 billion, leading to the purchase of approximately 4 million acres of land to support wildlife. There's also state bonding and state and federal grants. Uh, the, big, the most important one is the Land for Maine's Future. Uh, and this is the primary funding vehicle for conserving land for natural and recreational value. Started in 1987, uh, when Maine citizens voted to approve a $35 million bond to, pur to purchase lands of statewide importance. Uh, since that time, 
there have been more bonds uh, awarded, but also the, the scope of the program has broadened to include protecting farmland, working waterfronts, and recreational areas. More than 600,000 acres have been conserved uh, since its formation in 1987. There's also gifts, donation, and mitigation land. So sometimes people do gift or donate us land. Uh, what's happening more often now is mitigation. And this is when land is acquired from projects or programs intended to offset known impacts to an existing or historical natural resource, such as a stream, wetland, or the habitat of endangered and threatened species. Essentially, what this means is when land or habitat is compromised from development and or an environmental accident, habitat of equal size and value is purchased and given to us to protect by the offending party. Uh, sometimes uh, IFNW will hold on to the land uh, more often than not, though, the land is passed along to a nonprofit, such as a land trust or an, uh, another type of NGO, uh, just so that there's not a conflict of interest. So when it comes to wildlife management, we have some primary objectives, uh, and this is to uh, promote endangered or threatened species, uh, to protect unique natural areas and communities, uh, to promote featured wildlife species, and to promote and maintain biodiversity and structure. So when it comes to endangered or threatened species, we coordinate with regional staff and IFNW species specialists to develop habitat management strategies and operations to improve habitat for these uh, endangered species throughout the state on our wildlife management areas. And these areas offer the habitat type or presence of the species in proximity or on the management area itself. Uh, when it comes to unique natural areas, we work with the Maine Natural Areas Program to gain an understanding of the unique plants and rare communities documented in an area and assist with promoting these types while providing wildlife habitat management opportunities associated with them. We also have uh, some featured species that the department likes to promote uh, this involves rough grouse, American woodcock, and white-tailed deer. Um, and those are really the three primary game species that we look to manage for on wildlife management areas. Also, snowshoe hare and moose benefit from this type of featured species management as well. Finally, there's the biodiversity and structure. So promoting stratification of vegetation by differing age classes and species make up to provide suitable habitat for a suite of wildlife species by offering horizontal cover, maintaining biodiversity by retaining species that are less prevalent than others, also promoting both soft and hard mass species on the landscape to increase forage availability for wildlife species. This can involve acorns, beech nuts, apples, blueberries, or really any mass producing uh, vegetation. We have secondary objectives as well. One of them is demonstration. And so we demonstrate how silviculture can be used to manage wildlife habitat. We intentionally use different silvicultural techniques to produce different forest structures for the benefit of target, targeted wildlife species. We're more intentional about promoting mass producing species um, for a food source, and we're more intense with our retention of snags, cavity trees, coarse woody debris, and other non-timber elements uh, than a conventional timber-centric forest management uh, job would do. Um, part of this demonstration involves public interaction, so we'll present at workshops or classes with different organizations and agencies so that landowners and other interested parties can hear about our habitat management methods and be able to ask questions. There's also the public access of our land um, and our areas after a habitat management operation independently offer a display of our methods and the results over time for people to witness. There are some signs installed on our wildlife management areas to explain the habitat and management techniques that are used to create those habitats. 
And sometimes our wildlife management areas are used as field site locations for workshops, classes, trainings, and other, and other educational uses. Um, some of our properties have been used as study sites for university research projects. Uh, another secondary objective we have is recreational access. And providing access promotes the use of the WMAs for a variety of recreational uses. And we support these recreational uses as long as they don't conflict with the wildlife management objectives. Recreational uses consist of consumptive, such as hunting, fishing, and foraging, and non-consumptive, like hiking, snowmobiling, and ATVing. Access is predominantly provided through road improvement and building for timber harvesting. So when we have a timber harvest, we have to improve the road or build new roads to help facilitate that process. A byproduct of that is that it results in greater access and improved road conditions throughout the WMAs for the general public to use as well. We also do standalone road and boat ramp improvement projects when timber harvesting isn't an option, just so that those um, infrastructures are maintained for the public to use. Uh, hiking trails are allowed um, along with snowmobiling and ATV trails by permission to other groups, such as like a land trust or uh, a snowmobile or ATV club. Uh, and they are not maintained by the department. So our habitat management activities, um, this involves a lot of stuff. This is brush mulching and clearing, uh, field mowing and maintenance, planting and seeding of all trees, shrubs, and food plots. There's the management of water levels on impoundments, building and installing nest boxes, gates and signs, lots of boundary line work, apple and chestnut tree release and then pruning. Uh, invasive plant species control is a big one. There's road construction and maintenance. And then there's timber harvesting. And that is for the manipulation of forest habitat. And it's by and large the predominant work activity that we do. Revenue generated from a timber harvest is matched by the federal government. That money is then reinvested back into the WMAs to pay for all the other habitat management activities, which I just listed, because those can be very costly. Uh, those images there are some examples of what we've done. The one on the left is meeting with Joe Dembeck, who we use to prune our apple trees so that they maintain good health and vigor to produce apples, which are an excellent food source for wildlife species. That middle image is uh, burning a field on Swan Island. Uh, and that helps promote native plant species within those grasslands on the island. The image furthest to the right is installing a beaver deceiver structure to maintain road uh, integrity. This allows beavers to still populate the water without them plugging the culvert or raising the water level, thus damaging the road. So as a summary, wildlife management areas are required for the protection and enhancement of wildlife resources of the state. Coordinated planning and management ensures wise use of the resource. Compatible recreational uses are allowed and enjoyed. And permanent conservation status ensures public access for future generations. So this finally brings us to Fry Mountain. This is located in the towns of Monteville, Knox, and Morrill. It's 5,257 acres in total. It's divided into 11 different compartments that range in uh, size, mostly about you know, two to 400 acres. And it's predominantly managed for the upland wildlife species that require forest habitat. Rough grouse and American woodcock are the focal species by maintaining fields and young forest, these habitats are also complementary to snowshoe hare, small mammals, and pollinators as well. Deer, bear, and turkeys are other species identified for management and are provided habitat by managing for mature forests that provide mast, browse, and cover opportunities. So what is the history of Fry Mountain? 
and how did it arrive at the forest condition that we see today? European settlers first moved to the Montville area around 1780, and they established sawmills along the streams to take advantage of the vast forest land before them. Between 1810 and 1840, the forest is cleared rapidly to support the booming shipbuilding industry along the coast. Farms fill the space that was once forest, and this becomes a dominant economy. Between 1840 and 1940, uh, there is mass farm abandonment along coastal Maine due to the loss of local economies, the Industrial Revolution, the Civil War, and also soil nutrient depletion from you know, 100 to 200 years of poor farming practices. And this marks the beginning of the field reversion era. Between 1937 and 1943, the U.S. government buys lots in Montville, Knox, and Morrill through the Bankhead Jones Tenant Act. And this is part of the New Deal, and it allowed struggling farmers to sell their land to the U.S. government. It was a buyout program. In 1958, the Fry Mountain properties are transferred to Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for the purpose of wildlife habitat management. By this point, many of the fields and pastures have reverted back to forest, and they are in a young state of development. Starting about the 1960s through the 1990s, IFNW establishes uh, blocks and strips to manage for rough grouse and woodcock, and those strips and blocks are maintained as young forest. They plant hedgerows in large fields for more edge habitat, and they also put out firewood permits, which resulted in spotty light cuttings throughout the property. There was also the harvesting of diseased red pine stands, which were then replanted to white pine. Red pine was a popular species to plant uh, during the depression on farms. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, there are commercial harvests put out to maintain and improve the mature forest habitat in the areas that weren't previously managed on the area. And we identified compartment F for operations because of the declining condition of the habitat and a lack of evidence showing recent habitat management. So once an area has been identified for management, we have to begin the process of writing a prescription for it. And that starts with a site examination where we gather data to begin forming management objectives. That image furthest to the left is what a data sheet looks like. And the site examination process is a scientific survey where at random points throughout the area, we stop and we take data. And this involves the tree species, their size and condition. We make note if the tree is alive or dead, if the tree might have a cavity or a den, that's important to know because that's nesting opportunities. Uh, we take notes about the topography and the operability of the site, uh, what trees are regenerating, or if there are no trees regenerating naturally. Uh, we take note about the forest condition. We take notes about any evidence of wildlife use and what habitat it could provide. We take note about the presence of invasive species, such as plants and insects. And we make preliminary notes about what equipment mixes we would like to see work that stand and preliminary thoughts about a civil cultural treatment. So once that data has been collected, the numerical data we can put into Excel and put into um, forest inventory programs to analyze it. Specifically, we use NED3 by the US Forest Service. And once that data has been analyzed, it gives us a broad scale overview of the area and as a whole. And from that large tract of land, we can break it down into smaller units of forest that we call stands. And a stand is an area of forest that can be clearly defined from one another because it shares multiple similar characteristics. And this can be based upon tree species, the average tree age, the forest structure, the soil type, and even the past land use. From there, we can start writing a prescription. 
and habitat management prescription is a collaborative effort between IFNW staff, including the biologists, the species specialists, and the foresters. There's also input from the main natural areas program as well. And a prescription will start off with a broad overview of the uh, property as a whole. It will describe the compartment um, as a whole, but really the meat and potatoes is a stand-by-stand -stand description uh, of the forest. And a prescription stand page outlines the stand area and its cover type the tree species composition, the soils and their operability, general remarks and concerns about that forest stand. It will put forth wildlife objectives based upon the condition and the biologist goals. We as the forester then make management recommendations that will then complement those wildlife objectives. And then we will prescribe a silvicultural treatment that will help uh, uh, succeed at creating and uh, meeting those wildlife objectives. We also make an attempt to describe the post-operation uh, stand condition as well. So once that's been done, we move into operations planning. And that often begins with timber marking, which is the painting of trees that will be cut according to the prescription. There's also then operations layout. Uh, first, you have to find uh, where the yards for the timber harvest operation will be throughout that uh, area. And from there, you can start flagging the skid trails. And that image on the right shows the flagging of the skid trail. So what that is, is that the equipment will follow that trail, cutting its way in, cutting that path to get around inside the woods and those will be the main arteries that the equipment will follow and pull the products out of the woods to the yard where trucks can then uh, take the products to the mills. Uh, there's also road access improvement. This involves the daylighting of roads, the improvement of ditching and culverts on existing roads, and if need be, building new roads from scratch if an area is too inaccessible. From there, we begin to hire a logger, and this will be based upon uh, the harvest system we want. And when I say harvest system, I mean uh, a whole tree harvest, a tree length harvest, or a cut to length system. We can also specify uh, what kind of equipment we want within that system. And we can establish any other requirements that we want since we are the landowner. And basically you're forming the elements of a contract that um, will shop around. And since we're the state, we can't just go directly to a logger um, for a job. We have to put it out to bid. And so uh, any job that the state has that, ha that costs over a certain threshold, it has to be posted publicly. And this is done through the um, procurement services website. And on there, contractors on file uh, can uh, search for jobs and, uh, and uh, submit a bid. And this provides fair and equal opportunity to the contractors in the state for work. And so what the contractors are looking at are bid package. And this describes the job in extreme detail. And it establishes all sorts of requirements that we have. And it describes the bid evaluation process. Uh, a bid package for a timber harvest uh, hat usually includes the volume of wood that will be cut according to species and product grade, uh, the volume of wood according to different skidding distances. It'll uh, also include the maps of the harvest area. Uh, it breaks down just about every aspect of the job and whatever requirements we have in extreme detail so that there are really no questions uh, left unanswered. Um, there's also a, a sheet uh, to bid on the stumpage rates based on species and product. So ultimately what the contractor will be filling out is what price they can offer us uh, for certain products and species. There's also finally the bid selection. So 
Um, there are points on the score sheet for being master logger certified. There's points for employing a main licensed forester. And obviously there's points for having the highest stumpage rate. And the score sheet categories uh, can differ from job to job. And obviously once those uh, sheets have been evaluated, the bidder with the most points wins the job. So moving on to what the prescription for Fry Mountain Compartment F is. So this is what the prescription looks like from a 10,000 foot view. Fry Mountain is over 5,000 acres in size. Compartment F is 472 acres. In total, we'll be operating about 400 acres. Uh, and that's a breakdown of basically the different silvicultural prescriptions by acre. So the difference between the 400 and 472 is that we have areas of retention, so areas that won't be operated at all. There's going to be an 11 acre hemlock reserve. Uh, this was an area of really old hemlock that was exhibiting what I thought would be early stages of old growth forest that we're just going to let develop on its own. There's also acreages associated with uh, buffers around brooks, wetlands, and other water resources. Uh, that can range in size from 25 feet to 125 feet, depending on the resource. And if you have a lot of those, and we do at Compartment F, that can add up uh, rather quickly in terms of acres. There's also a stand uh, that won't be operated just because it's inaccessible. And then there's also inoperable terrain. So this is ground that's just too wet, too steep, or too far away that you can't get to it for the operation. This is what the prescription looks like once it's been mapped. So each color there represents a different civil cultural treatment. The dark green is single tree selection. The tan blobs are large group selection. The pink and green dots are small group selection. Yellow is thinning. Pink is pre-salvage. Uh, orange is clear cut. The teal is an overstory removal. And those uh, outlined pink blocks are rough grouse blocks. Habitat management. You're probably wondering at this point, how do the timber harvest treatments discussed relate to habitat management? And it's because they help create the different stages of forest development, which we call forest succession. Just like any other living organism, forests go through distinct stages of development. This is a natural process and it's cyclical. Once climax forest is achieved, it's not static. The process can and will start over again. Wildlife species evolved for a millennia with this process, and over time they developed different advantages based on these structural stages. Different wildlife species need different stages of forest development for their ideal habitat. Making sure all these stages of forest development are present on a wildlife management area with upland forest is a foundational objective for our habitat management. And this is because it helps ensure as many different wildlife species are being uh, managed for as possible. Some species require multiple stages of forest succession to fulfill their life cycle. And having close proximity between these different forest stages helps create high quality habitat because it reduces the travel distance. So that could mean uh, they have to expend less energy traveling in between uh, their ideal habitats and also re may reduce the chance of them being preyed upon as well during that travel time. Whenever possible, we try and allow for the smooth transitions from fields to mature forest. So that diagram at the top, even though it shows uh, how a forest will develop over time, we do actually try and physically create that structure um, on site. So if we have a field uh, immediately adjacent to it, we try and manage for a younger uh, forest condition that will then gradually lead into mature forest. 
So now we'll take a look at each stage of succession and the wildlife habitat it provides. Every stage we'll look at will be created or enhanced at compartment F on Fry Mountain. So uh, the image on the right shows the fields on the top of Pierce Hill in compartment F, and they were specifically designed for optimal rough grouse habitat. Their unique shape and arrangement provides increased amounts of forest edge, and grouse prefer young, dense hardwood stands with plenty of tall, woody vegetation like hazelnut, service berry, and other mass-producing species near the edges of fields. And these fields are maintained by mowing uh, or burning so that they don't revert back to forest and that they also promote native plants within them. Mowing can't take place any earlier than July 15th, and this is because it uh, avoids destroying any grassland bird nests. And it also allows for the full development of native flower species like goldenrod and aster for pollinator species. The fields at Fry specifically are mowed on a biannual basis. That means half the fields are mowed every year. So uh, whatever field isn't mowed in a certain year is allowed to develop really late into the fall season for even later pollinator opportunities. If a field's burned, um, this is done mostly in the early spring before the birds nest or late in the fall after the birds have fledged. And we always have a burn plan in place. Sometimes uh, there's nesting boxes placed along fields or in fields for the added benefit for songbirds as well. So moving on to the next stage is shrub field and young forest. And um, this is ideal uh, for woodcock and grouse too. And predominantly area management is used to continuously maintain shrub field and young forest in the same area over time. Uh, grouse and woodcock share many habitat qualities. They both need dense young deciduous cover. Now grouse are more upland, while woodcock are found more on lowlands. This is because they need wet ground for them to probe for food. And area management uh, is basically the same style of area management used in timber harvesting, except it's been adapted by the biologists uh, for a shorter rotation to maintain young forest. And this involves taking a unit of uh, suitable forest condition, dividing it up into two to three acre size blocks, and then harvesting each block at staggered intervals. So at, what happens is um, by the time you get to your last block that you're cutting, the first one you ever cut is aging back into the condition for it to be cut again. And this ensures that there's suitable uh, cover within uh, an area continuously throughout time. At Fry Mountain, we have these scheduled blocks, but we also uh, create these conditions uh, through timber harvesting in suitable stands. Um, this is most often uh, done with a, an intolerant hardwood stand. So we'll use early successional management in aspen and paper birch to perpetuate uh, that stand type. And silviculturally, we'll use a large group opening, so something that's over half an acre in size. And this um, helps promote uh, intolerant hardwoods such as aspen and paper birch. Uh, doing this uh, type of harvest in the winter also provides for vigorous aspen shoots the following spring and summer. This is because the nutrients are stored in the roots and when it's cut in the spring, it will uh, send up all its stored energy into resprouting. In the case of aspen, uh, the roots will actually uh, create a sucker and it'll be a new tree. Whereas for something like paper birch, it'll stump sprout vigorously. And uh, providing this habitat within proximity to wetlands and seeps further provides habitat for woodcock. And if you're further up on higher ground, it would be for rough grouse. Now, when it comes to softwood, young softwood forest 
uh, is ideal for uh, you know a different group of wildlife species such as snowshoe hare, uh, certain songbirds, and Canada lynx. And we'll use young softwood uh, forest creation for areas that are dominated by mature balsam fir or in areas already well regenerated with uh, softwood species. So we could use uh, some type of group selection, an OSR, or even a clear cut to uh, achieve this uh, young forest, so, uh, young softwood forest uh, condition. So finally, we have mature forest, and depending on what type of uh, cover you have, it could provide different uh, habitat for different wildlife species. So in a mature softwood forest, there's potential to improve or maintain uh, deer wintering areas. And a deer wintering area has to have at least 50% softwood crown closure and have a stand height of at least 35 feet. And those uh, components help prevent uh, deep snow depths. So the deer will yard up in um, a forest stand that has those components because it's uh, easier to get around in because they're not limited by the snow depths. They're usually protected by wind uh, so that they can stay warmer. And that softwood uh, closure also helps insulate um, the air within there. So at night, it doesn't get as cold as an open field or even a hardwood stand. So if we're working in a mature forest stand, uh, this is a good uh, candidate for single tree selection. And so this allows for the softwood crown expansion on residual trees. Uh, if we're pulling out the hardwoods, doing this in the wintertime uh, will increase hardwood browse through stump sprouting, uh, and the deer will uh, browse upon those stump sprouts as a winter food source. Uh, and we are looking to promote overall longer lived softwood species such as spruce, hemlock, and cedar. In a northern hardwood stand, uh, this is opportunity to manage for uh, food sources. So, you know, oak have acorns, beech trees have beech nuts, but also the catkins on yellow birch, the seeds of ash and sugar maple are also food sources for turkeys and uh, songbirds. And like I previously said, the woody twigs and tips are browse uh, uh, opportunities for deer and other mammals. And again, using a single tree selection uh, treatment is uh, appropriate here. Uh, we are looking to promote the crown expansion on ideal uh, residual trees. So that crown expansion would hopefully mean uh, more mass production, meaning more food. And we're looking to perpetuate um, tolerant to mid-tolerant species. Uh, because they're longer lived and they help maintain that quality habitat for a longer period of time. Also, a single tree selection method uh, creates an uneven aged forest structure for increased horizontal and vertical diversity. And this uh, works as cover. In a mixed wood forest, uh, this is opportunity to manage for cover and mast in the same place. In the southern half of the state, where the snow depths are not the limiting factor, you could find deer in the wintertime in a mixed wood stand. Uh, an oak pine forest type, like pictured on the right, is also excellent turkey habitat. There is scattered pine for roosting, but there's also the oaks which provide a food source in the same place. Again, we're looking to promote tolerant to mid-tolerant species like oak, pine, hemlock and yellow birch. And you could use a variety of different silvicultural treatments. You could use single tree selection. You could also use a shelter wood system with reserves to perpetuate those uh, shade tolerant species while also maintaining uh, overstory cover as well. Retention trees are an essential aspect of our forest management approach. And uh, most importantly, we're looking for those wildlife trees. And this can be a variety of different trees. Um, 
This can involve standing snags, which are just standing dead trees. And a standing dead tree can be a food source uh, because it's rotting. It might have insects in it. So woodpeckers will target those to drill on looking for food. They also provide nesting opportunities like a, a, a dead standing mature pine is a good nesting opportunity for bald eagles. Also, they'll eventually one day fall to the ground and become coarse woody debris. And this is habitat as well. So uh, rough grouse need those uh, large logs on the ground to drum on. Uh, male grouse, part of their mating ritual is that they'll sit on the log and flap their wings and create this drumming sound and it attracts uh, females. Uh, as that log uh, decomposes, it may hollow out. Uh, that's a good den site for small mammals. Also, as it decomposes, uh, it releases nutrients back into the soil, enriching the soil. And it also becomes um, a good seedbed for tree regeneration as well. We also maintain trees that have cavities in them. Um, that's a good nest site for birds and owls. We also uh, maintain trees with twiggy nests. So if we find a twig nest, that means it's probably a raptor species and we'll put a 75 foot buffer around that tree so we don't disturb the nest and that we also uh, maintain the cover around that nest as well. And then we'll also uh, maintain anything that uniquely contributes to the elements of wildlife habitat. And this could be interesting branching or stem form that provides cover or connectivity um, the center image is a good example. That's a very old red maple where the bark is now beginning to peel vertically and underneath those peels people have found that uh, bats will uh, roost up underneath those uh, bark peels. So we'll keep that and we'll also maintain uh, on occasion vigorous red maple to age into that condition as well. We also maintain legacy trees. Uh, these are just very big old trees that they're open grown and they're a legacy of the agricultural past of the land. These trees often have hollow trunks or large cavities, so they provide nesting opportunities, uh, denning opportunities, even for large mammals. Um, if the tree's large enough and hollow enough, you can even find bear inside them. And they're never worth cutting because they're of extremely low quality. They also have very large crowns that could uh, damage your residual trees while being felled, and they serve a, a higher value as uh, wildlife habitat. Uh, we also keep track of the apple trees we may find, and we release them like a crop tree, and then we'll have them pruned later on for uh, increased health and vigor, but also uh, mast production because it's an excellent food source for animals. And we'll also uh, maintain and retain rare species that we find. So this could be smooth bark beech, it could be American elm, American chestnut, um, but also uh, trees that are found beyond their range. So if we're up north and we come across red oak, we won't cut the red oak and leave it so it can uh, produce seed and help uh, that species uh, continue its northern migration. At Fry Mountain, uh, we have found white oak, which is a little bit outside of its uh, normal range. So we uh, you know, maintain that and protect that to you know, allow that seed source to continue. But we'll also maintain species with uh, low presence as well. So if I'm in a spruce fir stand and come across a yellow birch, yellow birch is by no means rare, but it's unique for that site. And keeping that promotes species diversity within a forest stand. And building a diverse forest makes them more resilient to biological disturbances, which is something that's going to happen more often with climate change. So that covers our habitat management approach for compartment F at Fry Mountain, which we'll be looking at before, during, and after harvest over the next year. 
Uh, the following slides are just for general interest. They are just close-up views of some of um, the documents and maps that we use. Hope you enjoyed.